Hi, my name is Glenn Cowan. I'm from Concordia University. Let's do some review of CMOS IV characteristics. Okay, let's get started. The outline is shown here. We'll look at the MOSFET symbol and structure and look at the curves of the IV relationships qualitatively at first and then we'll go into the square law model equations. This slide shows a cross-sectional view of an NMOS transistor and the circuit symbol is shown up here. So the circuit symbol is a four terminal device. Sometimes people will draw it only as a third terminal device when they ignore the body terminal. Now when they're ignoring the body terminal they are usually assuming that the body or substrate is connected to the lowest voltage in the circuit. In a single supply circuit that would mean it's connected to ground. So we have the gate, the drain, and the source. Now there's two dimensions that are important for a MOSFET, the length and the width. And the length is shown here. So the length is the distance between the source and the drain, and that's the effective distance over which carriers move between source and drain when conducting the drain current. The width is the distance going in and out of the page, and that's the cross-sectional width of the transistor, and all things being held equal, the current flowing in the transistor is proportional to its, the transistor's width. So for a typical long channel MOSFET, we've got the symbol redrawn here. Oftentimes we are interested in this quantity called the overdrive voltage. And the overdrive voltage, or VOV, is defined as the gate source voltage minus the threshold voltage. The curves we're going to show are for the situation where the body and the source are connected together, or VSB is equal to zero. So this figure up in the top left shows a family of curves for a long channel MOSFET. We've got two main regions here. On the upper left, we've got this region called the triode region. On the lower right, or the right hand side, the saturation region. Let's take a look at the axes. So the horizontal axis is the drain source voltage from here to here, and the vertical axis is the drain current. So that's the current flowing down here with this reference direction. Okay, so in the triode region, the current increases as a function of drain source voltage and then levels off. And that point where it's leveling off is the boundary between the triode region and the saturation region. Now we've got some notion of this threshold voltage here. So the threshold voltage is relevant to the gate voltage, the gate source voltage. And generally what we're saying is that when the gate source voltage is larger than the threshold voltage, we get non-trivial amounts of current. When the gate source voltage is less than the threshold voltage, we're getting very small currents, though not exactly zero. A characteristic of the saturation region is that these curves are nearly horizontal, fairly flat. Each one of these curves corresponds to an increasing value of gate source voltage. Looking more closely at the triode region, we've got the drain current plotted against drain source voltage for fairly small, section, re, uh, small values of drain source voltage. We're down in this region here. In this case, these curves are almost straight lines, almost a linear relationship between current, the current flowing here, and the voltage from here to here. And we'll say more about that on a subsequent slide. If we look more closely at the saturation region, so for example, let's draw a vertical line here for VDS equals 1.4, and let's plot the drain current as a function of these values of VGS. If we do that, we'll get a curve like this. So for the gate source voltage less than a threshold, so the threshold voltage is half a volt, so we'll draw it here. So for a gate source voltage less than a threshold, we'll get almost zero current, then above the threshold, we'll get a current that's increasing quadratically. Let's think a little bit more about equivalent circuit elements for the MOSFET in the two regions of operation. So in saturation, we said the current is almost constant, a nearly horizontal line. So let's draw a horizontal line here. A horizontal line means a certain amount of current regardless of the drain source voltage. So from the point of view of the drain source voltage, this is looking like a current source because the current 
is independent of the voltage across those terminals. Fixed current implies current source. Now the value of that current depends on VGS. Bigger values of VGS, bigger values of drain current. And so that dependence on VGS implies a voltage controlled current source. The IV characteristics in the triode region are a little bit different. Here we have current that is almost a linear function of drain source voltage. So a linear IV relationship implies a resistance. So in deep triode, very small VDS, the MOSFET can look like a voltage controlled resistor. It's voltage controlled because the slope of this line depends on the gate source voltage. Okay. Here is a summary of the MOSFET current equations when we're not taking into account something we'll call channel length modulation. When the gate source voltage is less than a threshold, the current is small, approximately zero. We're going to call that the cutoff region. When the gate source voltage is greater than or equal to the threshold voltage, we're going to be either in the triode region or the saturation region. Which region we are in depends on the relative magnitude of the drain source voltage and the gate source voltage. So if the drain source voltage is less than the overdrive voltage, we're in triode. And we have this current voltage relationship. Notice that the current depends on the gate source voltage and the drain source voltage. But if the drain source voltage is small and this term is negligible, we'll see a linear dependence on the drain source voltage. In the saturation region, in the saturation region, we have a quadratic relationship between the drain current and the overdrive voltage. And in all of these cases, we have this leading term of mu n c ox w over l. Sometimes we'll call that the current factor or beta. So the current in triode or saturation is proportional to the width of the transistor when we keep the terminal voltages constant. Let's take a look at something we'll call channel length modulation. Up here, we have the charge distribution. Now we haven't talked a lot about charge distribution because we're generally assuming that you've seen this material before and you're just looking for a review of the IV characteristics. Under the gate, we have a charge distribution going from the source end up to the drain end. And when we're in saturation, this charge distribution is pinched off down to zero at the drain end. It turns out that if we increase the drain voltage beyond that triode saturation boundary point, the charge distribution moves in and the effective length of the transistor decreases. So decreasing the effective length is going to increase the current. Now we can go through an exercise where we put um, L is equal to L minus some delta L and turn the crank and we'll get a relationship that we can express like this where we take the original equation, the equation we had before, and we scale it by 1 plus lambda VDS. So lambda can be related to this quantity that you may have heard of called the early voltage in a reciprocal sense. So the units of lambda are in volts to the minus one. The early voltage would be in units of volts. Lambda depends on device parameters as well as the length. So if we increase the length of the transistor, we can shrink lambda and shrink the contribution of VDS. We can make it look more like a current source. This figure down here shows two families of curves for two different values of lambda. So let's take a look at the blue family of curve. So this upper one is the case where lambda is equal to 0.1, stronger dependence on VDS, steeper slope, less like a current source, and the lower one is for, so this upper one's for 0.1, and the lower one is for 0.05. Okay. And we could generate or go from one set of curves to the other by changing the length of the transistor. 
Now, we have nominally the same current for the same VGS, VDS, so going to longer length, going from this point 1 case to the point 0 5 case, could be achieved by doubling the length and the width of the transistor. So the aspect ratio is not changing, this term's not changing, but the lambda term, which depends on L, is shrinking. Okay, this slide shows those MOSFET equations that we had before, including channel length modulation down here. Now we often, or usually, don't put that term in here in triode because the current in triode already depends on VDS, but if you wanted to plot these two curves and have them be continuous and have um, a derivative that's continuous, you'd have to put this 1 plus lambda VDS term into the triode region equation to make them continuous. But we're usually not doing that much hand analysis in integrated circuit design. What we're usually doing is having these, these square law equations that we know aren't really correct in our minds to make us recall the qualitative trends. So one of those trends is, in saturation, the current depends on VGS. And even though it may not always be a exact exponent 2, it, it, it depends in a super linear fashion. So ID increases with an exponent greater than 1 uh, for, for VGS. Okay, here are the PMOS equations. Now, we want to have to remember as little as possible. So what we want to do is we want to recast the PMOS equations so they look as much like the NMOS equations as possible. So on the right here, we've got the PMOS circuit symbol. Here we've got the three terminal symbol. So bear in mind that the body terminal, which would be in here, is it's actually, when we don't draw it, we're assuming for a PMOS that it's connected to the highest terminal voltage in the circuit. Notice that the current reference direction is flowing from source to drain, which is opposite to what the ID reference direction was for the NMOS. So, we can use the exact same form of equation for the PMOS as we had for the NMOS if we make two modifications. The first modification we'll do is we'll put absolute value bars around the threshold voltage because the threshold voltage for a PMOS transistor is going to be a negative value for a typical enhancement mode PMOS transistor. The second change we'll make is we'll invert the polarities of these voltages. For the NMOS current equations, we had VDS and VGS. For the PMOS, we're going to have VSG and VSD. And if we do that, we have equations in the same form. There's no extra minus signs kicking around. The only other change we need to make is to use the mobility for holes, which typically is going to be less than half the mobility of electrons. So that means for a given device geometry, the PMOS transistor will have less than half the current. Smaller feature size models, so less than one micron of channel length, are going to behave quite differently from the square law equations that we presented. As I mentioned earlier, the square law equations are still good to keep in the back of your mind, but to do so, it's, it's important to bear in mind that they're not accurate. They're capturing some of the qualitative effects. We may see a smoother transition from triode to saturation than the equations would otherwise suggest. We'll get a steeper slope in saturation, so it's not going to act as much like a current source. Another way of saying this is that lambda will get bigger as the length gets smaller. We're going to have a non-quadratic behavior with respect to VGS due to velocity saturation and vertical field mobility degradation. So we're not going to get ID proportional to VOV squared. We may get an effective exponent that's less than 2, but usually greater than 1. And for all channel lengths, the current is not actually 0 for VGS less than the threshold. This region is going to be called the weak inversion region. And this is an important region for analog, but not as important for high-speed design. So for you know, low, medium-speed analog design, we may have many circuits where the gate source voltage is less than a threshold, or approximately a threshold, or 50 millivolts above a threshold. When the gate source voltage is right around a threshold, we're going to call that moderate inversion. 
Anyway, for high speed design, we're typically going to have gate source voltages 200 millivolts or more higher than the threshold voltage. Let's do some DC analysis examples. So a typical design problem involves thinking about an amplifier. Maybe we want to figure out its gain, its input resistance, its output resistance. And these quantities are going to depend on the DC operating conditions. So what's the DC drain current? What are the, the, the DC node voltages? So a first step in both what we do when we do hand analysis and what a computer does when it does transient or AC analysis is we compute the DC operating point. So let's do that for each of these two circuits. So for each circuit, let's compute the unknown terminal voltage and the drain current. Okay, here's the first example. We'll have mu NC aux is equal to 300 microamps per volt squared, threshold voltage of 500 millivolts, an aspect ratio W over L of 10, and a resistance of 1.2 kilo, kilo ohms. So if you like, you can pause the video and work out ID and V out. Okay, let's see what we did. So we want to find V out and ID. What equation should we use? We have triode and we have saturation. Well, what we're typically going to do is to assume a region of operation and then check to see if our assumption was valid. So here's the equation for ID in saturation. We're typically going to assume that a transistor is in saturation, particularly if we have it in mind that it's going to be an amplifier, because that's the region we would like it to be in. So we might assume we've chosen the values appropriately, we're going to assume it's in saturation, and then we're going to check to see if it was indeed in saturation. Notice that we've ignored channel length modulation here, and that's commonly done in DC analysis. The inclusion of channel length modulation is not significantly going to change the um, the estimate for V out or ID. So ignoring channel length modulation will not introduce a lot of inaccuracy at this stage. It's also going to simplify the calculations greatly. So we'll sub in the values here and work it through. So we get 1.5 milliamps. So let's calculate the output voltage here. So V out is going to be 3 volts minus I times R for that resistance. We plug the numbers in and we get 1.2 volts. So are we in saturation or are we in triode? So we've got 1.2 volts, 1.5 milliamps. Let's check. We are in saturation if the drain source voltage is greater than VGS minus VT. Is VDS greater than the overdrive voltage? So VDS is equal to the output voltage here, which is 1.2 volts and VGS is equal to 1.5 volts. So our threshold voltage is half a volt, and so yes, VDS is greater than VGS minus VT. 1.2 is greater than 1. We're close to the boundary though, so this might not be the best bias point for an amplifier if we want to have a large swing at the output while still keeping the transistor in saturation. But our assumption was correct. Now, what would happen if we were to increase the width of the transistor without changing that gate bias voltage? If we increase the width, the drain current will increase proportionally. That will cause V out to decrease. Eventually, the transistor will enter the triode region. So we could boost up the current to the same gate voltage and push it a little bit closer to triode. Similarly, we could shrink the width, shrink the current, increase V out, and move farther away from the triode saturation boundary. What would happen if we increase the resistance? Well, if we increase the resistance, we would also decrease the output uh, voltage. We might see a small decrease in drain current because of channel length modulation, but it won't be significant. Eventually, as we increase the resistance and that output voltage drops, the transistor will enter the triode region. Okay, let's look at the second example. In this case, we have a known gate voltage, drain voltage, but an unknown source voltage. Which equation should we use? Is it in triode or saturation? When the gate and drain are connected to the same voltage, it's always in saturation. 
So here's the saturation equation. The gate is at 3 volts. What do we plug in for VGS? V gate minus V source. The source voltage here depends on the drain current. So V source, Vs, is equal to ID times R. So now we have an ID on both sides of the equation. So we can substitute in all the values, but we have ID on both sides. So we're going to have to do a little bit more math to get to the answer. So we're going to get a quadratic, we're going to solve the quadratic, and we'll get two solutions. Can we eliminate one? Yes. The first, the, the larger value, the value on the right, 2.53 milliamps, if we plug that in, we'll get a voltage V source that is larger than the drain. It's larger than the gate. So our, our assumption that current's flowing in that direction, that we have a positive gate source voltage, that those aren't going to hold true, so that solution we'll say is inadmissible. The 1.1 milliamp solution is the correct solution, and if we are at um, 1.1 milliamps, then Vs is going to be equal to 1.1 milliamps times 1.5 kilo ohms, which is going to be equal to 1.65 volts. And we'll see that we have a VGS of 1.35, an overdrive voltage of 0.85, and we're, we're, we already said we're in saturation, and that is the admissible solution. Again, if we were to increase the width of the transistor, what would happen? Well, we're not, we're not going to get a lot more current to flow, because if we were to say double the width, well, if we double, if, if the current increases, it's going to push the source voltage up. So shrinking the width will lead to a smaller overdrive voltage and will lead to a mm, small increase in current. In the end, we're going to find that the bias current ID is going to be determined in large part due to the value of that resistance if we start to increase the width more and more and more. Okay, to recap. We've looked at the equations, so now we can, if we know the terminal voltages, we can determine if the MOSFET is in triode or saturation. We can compute the drain current based on voltages, and we could compute the needed voltages for a given drain current. We've also looked a little bit at predicting what happens to the bias voltage and current if WRL is changed. If you have any questions, send me an email, gcowan at ece.concordia.ca. Thanks for paying attention.